So we're going through some simple things and the passage that I received was these words from Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And I I like I've loved that passage because it's so wrong. <laughs> right? It just seems so wrong. It just can't possibly be true. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Really? I can't do much. This week I have been really sick. I got whatever's been going around and um and uh I told Sue earlier if she really loved me, she would send me home <clears throat> and and let me go back to bed. Um, I've been kind of up and down. Um, I think I get better and I go do something and then I get really wore out and tired. And I think I, I can't do all things. Um, but those words are really true. They are incredibly true, but they're in a context. And so I just like to read the the context of of where these words come from, because it's crucial that you know the context, and then the words make fabulous sense. So, so let me read that. Philippians um, 4, starting with um, verse 1. And I'm going to mispronounce these two names because I have no idea, because I didn't study Greek. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree with the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me, You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory to Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Some of you know Joe Lee. She is a granddaughter to us. Not really. My son takes care of her and her sister. And um, Tara and Jolie are, are, have become grandchildren to us. Um, Justin was their, is their godparent, and uh, he takes care of them uh, on the weekends, every weekend for their mother. Jolie um, is severely handicapped. She has... Um, a brain damage that means that she can't eat by herself she can't feed herself she has to the food has to be strained Um, she can't walk Um, there are many things that that little girl cannot do she's um, 
she's the light of our lives. She brings more joy into my life than all of you combined. <laughs> um, she is amazing. The problem with her is she's a morning person. That's her major fatal flaw. That's her sin. She is a cheerful morning person. So a week ago when I was staying with my son, overnight I'm sleeping on the couch, and, um, and at quarter till six in the morning, you hear Joe Lee hollering, Hey dude, come here! And then you hear her singing, and then you hear her throwing stuff and banging and making noise, and then she starts playing her toe, foot, leg, knee, butt, P-U game, and yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it's a little slow, right? Um, She wants to play games. She is, she's full of life at quarter till six in the morning. And I look at her and I think of all the beauty that she offers and all the gifts that she brings to my life and to the lives of my son, her mother, her sister, all who know her. And yet she can't do anything. (laughs) If she's not fed, she dies. She can't do all things through Christ who strengthens her. She's incapable of so many things. Her life is in the hands of those who love her. Quite a few years ago, Kathy's grandmother was in the hospital dying, and I went to visit her the morning of the day that she died. And as I walked in, I looked all around and I sat down and I prayed for her and and she was unconscious and there's all these tubes running in and out of her and there's all sorts of electrical wiring and there's machinery that's buzzing and making noises and there's all these blinking lights and there are medical personnel walking by from time to time checking things. And, and as I'm th- sitting there, I'm thinking, wow, so this is what it ends up like for all of us, right? All these lights, all this life support. And I thought, wow. Wow. If you unplug these machines, Grandma's dead. She's on total life support. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit whispered to me, and so are you. And so are you. The Holy Spirit whispered that to me because if God takes oxygen away from us for a few moments, <laughs> wait, we're dead. If he decides that gravity is no longer in play, <laughs> we're dead. If he moves us closer to the sun in the deteriorating circulation of that sun, we're dead. We're on total life support. We're in this bubble that flows through the universe where he gives us life. All that we have is from him. And we sit here in this world and we believe that we have power and strength and might and that we can do all things. That we have this, these amazing brains and we do. They're gifts from God. And that we can do these amazing things, and we can. They're gifts from God. But in our sin, in our sin, we start to think that we have certain rights. Certain privileges that we earn because we're smart, or because we're good, or because we're kind, or because we're somebody, or because we're born with a particular name, or we're born with a particular color, or a race, or some sort of privilege that we think we might have. We have this sense of entitlement. I have demands on how my life should be. 
Is that true for you? <laughs> My life has to be a certain way. Do you have demands on what God needs to do? What does God owe you? What are some things that God owes you? What does he need to do in order for you to be happy with your life? Do you need to be married? Do you need to have a good job? Do you need to have kids? Do you need to be able to buy a house? Do you need to have a rich relationship with your spouse? Your kids? Do you have the right to have friends who care about you? Do you have the right to good health? Lots of money? Actually, probably maybe you have a list of things that you're entitled to. A grocery list, list of, of what God must do in order for you to be content. So what are you thinking that God still needs to do? What is it that he owes you? Are you looking to others? It's interesting that Paul in this passage says that he's content in his circumstances. That there were those who he looked to to supply his needs. But then he says he's content. In whatever circumstances he finds himself. So often we look to others to supply our needs. Who do you look to to supply your needs? Your parents? Your friends? This community? Your family? Your spouse? And then the hard question, who lets you down? Who abandoned you when you needed them the most? It's interesting that Paul talks about abandonment. It's a big issue. It's an issue for me. It's an issue for you. It's an issue for all of us. Abandonment. Those who need us the most, or those who we need the most, don't come through for us. They're not there for us. They don't provide for us. They don't care for us. They didn't, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. My mom died a few months ago. <clears throat> And I miss her. <laughs> and I was talking to my brother this week, and I, he was talking about the ways in which he misses her. And um, it, it, it just really resonated with me. My mom would call me every day, and she would tell me what was going on. And I mean, these weren't like epic phone calls, because <laughs> they were every day. They were just the boring, mundane, everyday things. And I miss those phone calls. And I miss mom. And when I really start thinking about what it is that really, really, really scares me is, even though I am 64 years old, there was something powerful about having mom there. (laughs) There was this craziness in my head that thought, if all hell breaks loose and the world comes to an end, we can always go stay at mom's. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? 64 years old and I still need my mama. You know, like, really? And now she's not there. She abandoned me. When I was 16 and my dad died, he abandoned me. He left me on my own. And it was cruel, and it was hard, and I was scared. No one likes to be abandoned. It's a scary place. It's a real place. When we look to others to provide for us and care for us and supply our needs, and Paul looks to these churches to supply his needs as he travels, and some didn't come through. And some did. And sometimes they wanted to, but they couldn't, right? You know? Pretty sure mom wouldn't invite our crazy family back into her house, right? 
even if she were alive. We look to other people to supply us, to care for us, to provide for us, and they let us down. Paul claims to be content. He is content in whatever circumstances he finds himself in. That's a weird thing. (laughs) That is a really weird thing. He claims to be content, but then you hear him in another passage, in another place, describe all the ways in which he suffered. Whatever else anyone dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are you Hebrew? So am I. Are you an Israelite? So am I. Are they offspring of Abram? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman, he says, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indig- indignant? Wow. <laughs> Paul's list is pretty good, and he can find contentment in those circumstances. The interesting thing is he's writing this passage from prison. He's not writing this passage when things are going swimmingly, when they're fantastic, when everything's going great. He hasn't arrived at this point in his life where he says, finally, it's working. Finally, I got it. Finally, things are great. Now I'm content. He's content in prison. When I make my list of things that I need in order to be content, they don't include include imprisonment or beatings or being robbed or being shipwrecked. Those aren't the kinds of things that I go, oh, let me add that to my list of things I need. We do have these demands. They're real. I remember when we were living in the apartment after we were first married. It was a little one bedroom apartment. We had crazy neighbors. We had a neighbor who played his stereo so loud that you could hear it blocks away. If I just had a house, then I would be happy. And we got a house. A year later, now if I just had a bigger house, because kids came along, if it was just a bigger house so the boys could each have their own room because they're constantly fighting, if I could just have this, then my life would be complete. Then life would be good. If I could just do the things that I need to do in order to get the stuff I need. So contentment isn't about getting stuff. Whenever you get enough stuff, you never get enough stuff. If you have money, you need more money. If you've got a good retirement plan, you need a better retirement plan. If you have a good car, good enough car, you need a better car. If I just had a little something extra. 
So Paul's contentment isn't found in getting more stuff or getting his act together or getting deeper and better relationships or any of that. His contentment is found in Christ. And in Christ, he is set free from stuff. He's set free from circumstances. The circumstances don't matter because Jesus is enough. God is enough for him. Now, how does that work, right? I don't know how that works. Like, how does that work? How, how does it, how do, like, if I'm suffering and struggling, how does it work that Jesus is enough? Paul has this incredible confidence in the goodness of God, and the goodness of God is that irrespective of what happens to him, he is held in the hand of Jesus. He's held in God's hands. In another place he says, if I live or die, it doesn't matter. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So first of all, the fear of death is taken away. The terror of death is taken away. For those last few weeks, I watched my mom pleading with God to just take her home. I said, why is he keeping me alive? I did the funeral for my mother's sister-in-law a week ago Friday, and, and Emma was known for every time one of the older ladies, including my mother, whenever they died, her, her, uh, her comment was, Why do they get to be the lucky ones? Why do they get to go see Jesus? Why do I have to get stuck here? It's just wrong. I should have the right to go. Come on, God. There's this deep and abiding faith that whether I live or die, I'm in God's hands. And we say, well, yeah, but I have to have these things. I I have to be independent. I, I can't be cared for. I have to, I have to have everything the way I want it. I, I have to have enough. And Jesus comes to free us from that. He comes to free us from that binding stuff. He wants to give us the freedom that whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, we're free. We'll suffer. (laughs) One of my favorite promises of Jesus is and always will be, in this world you will have trouble greatest promise. Such a beautiful promise. In this world, you will have trouble. No lie. Absolutely. True. Paul's in prison. He's been beaten, robbed, everything gone wrong in his life. But he has the knowledge of the goodness of God. And somehow the presence of God in those circumstances becomes enough. And then the freedom comes to just live. To just live. Live with abandon. So Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because I'm no longer bound to things, because I'm no longer bound to this earth, because I'm no longer bound to have to have life be a certain way, because I don't have those boundaries any longer, I am free to live. I'm free to enjoy the money that I have, to enjoy the, the home that I'm given, to, to enjoy the people in my life, to, to, to just live. To live with joy, to rejoice I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Paul says. I can do. Paul reminds us that our capabilities are in Christ. We are equipped by Christ to do good works that God prepared for us to do. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 reminds us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Isn't that fabulous? God's prepared good things for you to do. When you walk with him, he's giving you good things to do. And you get to walk in them. 
take pleasure in them, take joy in them. I can do. I'm a can-do guy. I can do stuff. I can do it. Because Christ prepared it for me to do. And he will walk with me into it. I can do all things, Paul says. There aren't limitations on what Christ can accomplish using his people. What burdens do you have that you think preclude you from doing what Christ has called you to do? Is it your sin? Is it your mental health? (laughs) Really bad student? When I was in school, I graduated in the bottom half of, or bottom third, rather, of my high school. And I wanted to go to seminary and become a pastor, and my mother had written a sister, uh, my sister Miriam a, a letter, and she said, Rod wants to go to seminary and become a pastor. But I don't think he could do that, because he's really, really bad in school. <laughs> and he's not going to be able to go to seminary and be able to accomplish anything. So I'm encouraging him to not go that direction. You know what? She's right. (laughs) She was absolutely right. There is nothing in me that could be a pastor. I don't have that skill set. I don't have that ability. I don't have that talent. I struggle with sermons. I don't know how to pronounce the Greek or learn the Greek or My brain doesn't work that way. Yeah. (laughs) Greatest amen ever. Thank you. (laughs) My ADD issues, my mental health issues, my learning disabilities preclude me from being a pastor. What precludes you from doing what God's called you to do? Your sin, your mental health, your financial circumstances, your present family circumstances, what's going on in your family life? What are those things? See, the nice thing is God can call somebody in the middle of their life out of being an auto parts warehouse chief financial officer and turn them into a pastor if he wants. He can do whatever he wants. He's amazing. He can prepare all things, anything, whatever thing. He can prepare it for you to do, and you can do it. I can do all things, Paul says. Well, I can't do all things in my own power. He says you can do all things through Christ. Having your life subsumed into Christ's life. It is no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, Having been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You have to submit your life to Christ. You give your life over to Christ and he can accomplish anything through him. It's in his power, it's in his strength, and it's in what he's done. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One of our biggest problems is we want to be strong. We want to be looked up to and respected and admired. We admire strength and power and skill and talent and ability. Christ is made perfect in, weak, in weakness. Second Corinthians 12, 9 through 10 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
about. It's our having it all together, getting it all right, doing the good things, being strong, popular, positioned, well thought of. All those things that get in our way. Leading with our weakness. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Why is that? Because the beauty is that when we are weak, people don't see us that way. Because they see Christ in our weakness. We're all broken, cracked, cracked pots, literally. And we think, if I could just get my, all those little patches, all those little holes filled up, then I'd be okay. But it's those cracks, it's that brokenness where Jesus shines. If you think I can be a pastor because of my skill and my talent and my ability with the language and all those other things, you gotta, you're crazy. What you see if I preach a sermon that matters, that has any value of all, at all, it's because you see Jesus. You see Jesus saying, boy, that boy's such a mess. I'm going to have to talk through him. I'm going to have to let what he comes up with fall to the ground and let people hear what he didn't say. I got my work cut out for me in God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have the power to walk in the freedom of being able to say to you, this is what Jesus says. This is what the Bible says. Don't be afraid of your weakness. Celebrate it. Enjoy it. It's where people see Jesus in you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul can go through all this rejection, all this pain, all this suffering, all this struggle, and all this hurt, not because he has his act together, not because he's Superman, Because in Christ, he receives power and might and strength and ability to do that which he cannot do. One of the things, a test that came out quite a few years ago, where they kind of look at what your strengths are, so that, and it was really popular in the corporate world, and it was also popular for a season in the church world, and you kind of did this testing, and you find out what your great strengths are. And, and it was fabulous. I took the test, and my number one strength was ideation. I have a million ideas. And Eric will remind you that just because I have a million ideas doesn't mean they're all good. Matter of fact, very few of them are. But I constantly have ideas. You want an idea of how to do stuff? Man, I'm your guy. I can come up with a million ways to do it. Ideation, number one strength in strength finders. So when we went to this church gathering and they were going to give us this test and administer this test, I said, you know, I kind of object to this on principle. And they go, why? You'll know what your strengths are. You'll know where you best operate. And I said, yeah, but we're believers in Jesus. We need a weakness finders test. (laughs) Where's our weakness? Where do we just stink? Where do we got nothing? Because that's where Jesus is. Jesus is in our weakness. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Maybe a question or two. Push back, thoughts. God, you're just nuts. We already know that. It's been established. Wow. Good. Let's pray. Father God, Shine in our weakness. In our abandonment, 
from each other in our abandonment from you because of our sin you did not leave us there you come and you lay down your life Jesus for us so that we can live Live in freedom, live in joy, live with abandon, (laughs) live without fear. Thank you that we can be content in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, knowing that you're with us and you never leave and you never forsake and you never turn away. Thank you that you're enough. So, Father, I pray that we would have the joy of living, knowing the truth that we can do all things through you, Jesus, who strengthen us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.